Hello, good evening to everybody. <coughs> it's me, Ella Bowman. Axi.com online teaching personal for zoology. So last class we started about the molecular structure, the molecular basis of inheritance. In that one we just talked about something about the DNA molecule. In the last one I concluded with the base pair rule as proposed by Charka. So and I have given three problems. Now the fourth problem based on that rule. So Charka, so this is the problem in his experiment on the chemistry of DNA. Charka estimated the base composition of human spores and found that adenine constituted 31% and guanine 19%. So what would be actually the quantity of cytosine in human diploid cell or somatic cells? Suppose for example if you take up just actually as per the problem you have A is equal to 31% then G is equal to 19% you know that one purid E is equal to pyrimidine purid is equal to pyrimidine so this is with reference to what is called the haploid cell that is a sperma cell and if you are taking the quantity wise if you are taking for example the amount of DNA in a normal sperm that is assumed just it is about 31 picograms plus you have G 19 it's equivalent to you know that one this is A this is G and that is equivalent to TC so T is also about 31 and then C is equal to 90 so totally we have 50 50 so in terms of weight let's assume it is about picograms in our mode so 50 grams of urine is equal to 15 grams of what is called pyrimidine but in the case of diploid cell if we are taking the quantity wise so it will be double you know that one in the case of so this is with reference to n leaving the percentage with reference to the weight not the percentage so if we are taking the diploid cell you know that one the amount being double that is for example a plus g 100 grams Let's assume our picograms is equal to just T plus C also equal to 100 picograms. So anyway, you have one is to one ratio. So this 100 gram or picograms of DNA in the diploid cell is equal to 100 percent. And then also this one. And if you are taking for example the spoon that have twice cell. And this one you see that one this is 50 percent. And this is 50 percent. And this 50% is equal to 100%. This 50% is equal to 100%. If you are taking the weight, the weight will be doubled in the case of diploid cell. If you are taking the percentage as pyrimidine is equal to just or equals, purine equals pyrimidine, that is the ratio is 1 is to 1. We are talking about only the percentage. So when we have the percentage in terms of what is called the sperm cell, the same percentage will be available in the diploid cell also. We are increasing the amount, we are doubling the amount, but we are not increasing the percentage. So percentage wise, we have purine is equal to pyrimidine. Whether it is 50% in the case of haploid cell or 100% in the case of what is called the diploid cell. So 50% in haploid cell is equal to 100% in diploid cell percentage wise. That is why in the case of that problem, as we have A is equal to 31%, G is equal to 19%. If we are talking about C, so G is always equal to C, you know that one. So in the diploid cell, the percentage of C is also 90%. Percentage wise, there is no change both in diploid and haploid cells. Amount wise, if you are calculating the mass of the DNA, then we have double amount of DNA in the diploid cell when compared to, that is haploid cells, but you have half of the amount of DNA being formed in the case of haploid cells. That is based on that one. So if you are just recognizing or just actually remembering and recalling uh, the ratio between purine and pyrimidine one is to one ratio then we can say the percentage wise also we have purine is equal to pyrimidine whether it is a diploid cell or a haploid cell so that is why we have the problem like this here in this problem we see that one so in diploid somatic cells the amount of A, G, C and T is equal to twice as the of gametes twice as the of gametes if you are just calculating the weight not in terms of parsley for example the amount of A in sperm cell is 31 picograms we are weighing with reference words for the picograms then the amount of A in diploid cell is 62 picograms that is it is being doubled 
But we are talking about the percentage what I explained earlier. See, by percentage wise, the percentage of A in deployed as well as haploid cells is equal. So in somatic cells, percentage of A is equal to 31 and percentage of T is equal to 19. So in sperms also, we have percentage of A is equal to 31 and percentage of A is equal to 19. So as D is equal to C, the percentage of C in sperm would be 19%. So there is no change with reference to percentage. We have changes with reference to only the weight. Either in deployed or haploid cells, we have to calculate accordingly. Now, suppose you are taking the double standard DNA. We are going to study later about the semi conservative method of replication. Each standard DNA in a double helical model is acting as a model or a template. And that is acting as a model or a template for the synthesis of another strand. Suppose you have, for example, there are two strands in a DNA molecule, A. So during the replication process, what will happen? The A can synthesize its own complementary strand, that is B. The B can synthesize its own complementary strand, A. So this is the parent, and these two are the daughter strands. So during the replication process, or during the duplication process, each strand of DNA is acting as a template. As a result, we are receiving two daughter DNA molecules. Now, the daughter DNA molecules as well as the parent DNA molecules would be exactly the same. There is no difference because we are taking the template or model from the DNA only from the DNA to the parent. So, the daughter DNA molecules and the parent DNA molecules would be similar or exactly identical. That's why the process is called replication. It's not duplication. So, if you say duplication one being double, in the case of replication also one being double, but the resultant products are exactly similar to that of the parental molecule. That is why it is called a replication process rather than duplication process. Now what are the characteristic features of DNA molecule? Some of the important facts about the DNA molecule. You know that one each DNA molecule is made up of two strands. And each strand being made up of many nucleotides. That is why we call them as polynucleotide chain or polynucleotide strands. So, it is made up of two polynucleotide chains, each strand being made up of more than 10,000 nucleotides. Then, so if you are taking the backbone, the backbone we obviously know already about the skeletal model, the skeletal structure, about the sugar, then the phosphoric acid molecules, how far they have been actually joined with one another. So the sugar and phosphoric acid molecules are joined with one another by means of we know that one phosphodiester bone or phosphodiester linkage, one to the third position, another to the fifth position of the just the two sugar molecules. So the backbone is constituted by sugar and phosphate. With the basis of projecting just into the center, they are facing each other. So the basis are placed perpendicular to. Suppose for example, these are the two strands. So here we have sugar, phosphoric acid, sugar and phosphoric acid. They are arranged alternately to form the backbone of each strand. Whereas the basis, see, suppose I am taking A, T, like that. So the bases are actually projecting just normally into the center and they are facing each other. The opposite bases formed in the opposite strands are facing each other. And the bases are always placed perpendicular to the strands, either A strand or B strand or strand A or strand B or either strand 1 or strand 2 according. So anyway, if you are taking the second characteristic feature of a DNA molecule, the backbone is normally formed by sugar and phosphate and the bases project inside, they are facing each other, they are arranged perpendicular to the strands. Now, if you are taking the two chains, the two chains exhibit what is called anti polarity or anti-parallel polarity. So I am taking the two strands. I mentioned all this is earlier in the skeletal model. So one strand is having the polarity 5 das, 3 das, starting with 5 das and ending with the 3 das. I mentioned about why we are using 5 das and 3 das. So in the case of 5 das, you know that one we have free phosphate moiety. At the 3 days end, we have the sugar has actually has a hydroxyl group, a free hydroxyl group. So this is one strand. 
If we are taking another strand, it runs anti parallel to this strand. So we have starting with 3 dash and ending with 5 dash. That is why normally the two strands exhibit anti parallel polarity. One strand is running in direction of 5 dash, 3 dash, whereas opposite complementary strand is running in 3 dash, 5 dash direction, and that is why it is called anti parallel polarity. Now, fact number 4 about the characteristic number 4. So you have normally the bases. So these are the two strands. I am taking just the sugar molecule and this is the sugar molecule. I am taking one base A. So it is normally packed with what is called T of the corresponding complementary strand in the corresponding position. Now this is the sugar. Now the bases in two strands are packed. How? Through hydrogen bonds. The two bases which are projecting towards the center, which are facing each other, they form a base pair. Base pair, according to what is called the Erwin Charkov's base pair rule. A is always forming a pair with the T, and T is always forming a pair with the A. Likewise, G is always forming a pair with the C, or C is forming a pair with the G, like that. So, there is a definite specific base pairing between A and T and G and C in a DNA molecule. That is why we have more stability for DNA molecule which will not be disturbed by means of most of the mutations. The frequency of mutation affecting the change in a DNA molecule is very less. It is about 1 in actually the base changes occurs 10 to 100 million base pairs. 1 in 10 to 100 million base pairs only we have a change. Such a stable molecule, the DNA. So that stability is first provided by the, what is called the hydrogen bonding between the bases. That is why the DNA is more stable than any other molecules. Now the bases in two strands are packed through the hydrogen bonds. It was proposed by Pauling's. That is why it is called Pauling's proposal and forming a basket. And now this A is always forming a pair with the T. And now another one G is always forming a pair with the cytosine and taking a similar manner. This is the sugar. So sugar plus base, you know that one, you have what is called the nucleus site and then we have the phosphoric acid molecule here that resulted in the formation of your nucleotide. This is the nucleotide, what is in already the skeleton, I don't remember the same one. So the bases in two strands are packed through hydrogen bonds forming base pairs. Now, how many hydrogen bondings formed between A and T and then G and C? So the number of hydrogen bondings between A and T would be 2. The number of hydrogen bondings between A and T would be 2. And similarly the number of hydrogen bondings between G and C is always 3. So the base pairing occurs because of the hydrogen bondings that provide stability. The number of hydrogen bondings is always constant. That is between A and T we have 2 and G and C is always 3. That is why if you have purine in one position of a strand, in the corresponding position the complementary strand become always pyrimidine. Now this is purine, you know that one A is purine and this one is pyrimidine. This is also you know that one purine, this is pyrimidine. So there is no base pairing occurs between two purines or between two pyrimidines. If it is so, we don't have any stability. Also, we have no uniform dimension of the DNA molecule that will be affected. So, the uniform dimension between the two, that what I am saying is nothing but the diameter or the distance between the two strands being maintained because of a definite base pairing. So, if you have purine in one strand in the opposite position, the corresponding strand or in the corresponding position in the complementary strand, we have always pyrimidine. So, purine, pyrimidine, like that one. So, that is why we have A is always forming a pair with the T and G is always forming a pair with the C. And that is the number of hydrogen bondings between A and T would be 2 and number of hydrogen bondings between G and C would be 3. And this number of hydrogen bondings also determine the rate of breaking of the two DNA strands. Now, almost the break occurs only between A and T as the bonding between A and T is lesser when compared to G and C. This is because of the number of hydrogen bondings. That is why the breakage always occurs. We want to clean the two strands. We want to just to actually unzip the two strands. It is always easy to break actually the bonding between A and T. This is because the number of hydrogen bondings between A and T is always less. So that is what is happening during the replication process. We will see later. 
Now what are the other characteristics? So I mentioned already adenine forms two hydrogen bonds with the thymine from opposite strand and vice versa. And likewise, bonin is bonded with cytosine with three hydrogen bonding what we represent. So that's why I mentioned always we have purine comes opposite to pyrimidine in the complementary strand. And as a result of this one, I mentioned already, because of the base pair between purine and pyrimidine, suppose you have purine here, this is pyrimidine. And if you have pyrimidine here, you have purine. So there is no pairing between two purines, there is no pairing between two pyrimidines. As a result of this one, there is a generation of uniform dimension between the two strands throughout the entire length. So if you are taking the B DAB, the diameter between or the diameter of the DAB or the distance between the two strands will be 20 angstrom. So the uniform dimension being generated, this is because of the definite base pairing between purine and pyrimidine. So I mentioned already. The uniform distance approximately between the two strands of the helix is about 20 angstrom. There is nothing in the diameter. This is because of the definite and specific base pairing between purine and the pyrimidine. Now, the next character the two chains are coiled in a right hand fashion, unlike what is called Z DNA. So, we have polymorphism also in the case of DNA. We have different forms of DNA A, B, C, D, E. So, in these A, B, C, D, E forms of DNA, in all these cases, we have the helical arrangement is towards the right side. So, we have a right handed helix. But if we are taking Z DNA, there is another DNA, what we call this one zigzag DNA, where you have the helix formation, or uh, actually the helix formation is towards the left handed direction. This is what is called right handed helix and this one is called what is known as a left handed helix. So in the case of almost A, B, C, D forms, we have right handed helix. So for example, in the case of B, D, N, A, what I give you the example. So this is what we have right handed helix in most of the biological available form of DNA, except in the Z DNA where we have the left handed helix, we will come back later. Now just actually this is one strand. And this is another strand, you know that one, like that. Just it is in the form of what is called a coiling. A coiling. Like that. This is not a place of overlapping, I mentioned. Imagine that we have a ladder. These are all the lungs, the steps, the steps of the ladder. Just imagine we are just twisting the two pole. This is pole number one, this is pole number two. We are twisting the pole. As we have uniform distance because of the base, this is the run, the step. The step is comparable to the basis A and T and for example G and C. As we have uniform length, why we are just folding the two poles, we are just making a helix, a spirally coiled star cast like structure. And as a result, as a result though here it is apparently overla overlapping structure as in the figure, it is not so. Here also we have the uniform distance of 20 angstrom diameter. This is the place, just actually apparently showing overlapping, there is no overlapping. So we have normally uniform just a distance between the two strands. Now this is one turn. This is one turn. In a star cast, you have just one full turn. So the total distance of one full turn is about what is called 34 angstrom. In terms of nanometer, 3.4 nanometer. This is the total, actually, the length or the distance of one term. And if you are taking another term like this, just here, this is another term having the uniform distance of 34 angstrom or 3.4 nanometer. Now, in each term, we have the total number of bases 10. The total number of bases 10. So, if you have the total number of bases 10, the distance between the two bases of the nuclear types would be just 34 divided by 10 or 3.4 divided by 10. So you have the distance between the two successive nuclear types would be 3.4 angstrom or 3.34 nanometer. So you are using the word one torque as pitch. The pitch is nothing but actually one term. 
And even we are using another word between the two bases, the distance is also called as the radius. The radius is nothing but the distance. The pitch is nothing but warm tone. The radius is nothing but the distance between two successive nucleotides. So anyway, if we are taking each tone, there are about 10 bases. In the case of, for example, B DNA, if we are taking Z DNA, we have just nearly about 12 bases. And even the total distance has to be also 45 angstrom. The total distance is also 45 angstrom. So we did not worry about. So anyway, each tone in a steric acid has 10 bases of a total distance of 34 angstrom or in terms of nanometer 3.4. So the distance between the two strands, sorry, two nucleotides would be 3.4 angstrom or 0.34 nanometer. So the word which refers to one tone. The word rise refers right to the distance between the successive nucleotides. So the two chains are called in right hand fashion. The pitch, what I mentioned, is nothing but a helix. The tone of a helix is about 3.0 nanometer, 3.4 nanometer, or 34 angstrom. As I mentioned earlier, we have the number of base pairs in each tone is about 10. So we have the equal distance between the two successive nucleotides would be 0.34 nanometer or 3.4 angstrom. 3.4 angstrom or we can express in the form of nanometer 0.34 nanometer this is another kind this is always constant for B form DNA the total distance the equal distance between the two just what is called actually the successive nucleotides that is also same in all cases of DNA now the plane of one base pair stacks over the other in a double helix suppose this is one base pair say an example of ANT and now this is another base pair, for example, G and C. So the plane of one base pair, now this is one base pair, and stacks over other. So suppose this one is stacks over this GC. A D is normally stacking over G C. As a result of this one, we have already stability because of the hydrogen boarding. There is also another factor that one or provides a confused stability for the DNA molecule. The other factor which would provide stability for the DNA molecule is nothing but the stacking over of the base pairs, the plane of stack. So you have one base pair above which another base pair like that we have that also provides stability. So the two factors which provide stability for the DNA molecule, DNA molecule are number one the hydrogen bondings and another one the base pair stacks over the other in a double helix. And these are the two major factors for providing stability. So normally you know that when the DNA is a double helical structure. But in the case of one bacteriophage, what I represented here, just pi x174, pi x174, it is having a simple standard DNA. I mentioned about the number of, I am not using the word base pairs in the case of this one. You know that one here in the case of uh, 5x174 battery phage, we have 53, sorry, 5386 nucleotides. Here I am not using the word base pair because only one standard DNA as in the case of for example RNA. We cannot represent the number of nucleotides in terms of base pairs. So we can have only that is nucleotides, the total number of nucleotides in the case of this 5x174 would be 5386. So it can be expressed only in terms of numbers of nucleotides, not in terms of numbers of base pairs, unlike for example human beings or in the case of equally bacteria. Now, so these are all some of the characteristics what I express. Now a little bit about polymorphism. So what do you mean by polymorphism? Even in the case of, for example, any character, the blood groups is also an example for polymorphism. Sickle cell RNA is also an example for polymorphism. When you are using the word polymorphism, it refers to the existence of more than one form in a population. It may be, for example, ABO blood groups. There are three different types of blood groups along with the four mixer type, the fourth one, what is called AB. So, we have more than one more than one type of phenotype or occurrence of more than one allele even for example the multiple alleles are being represented as polymorphism so the existence of more than one phenotype in a population is called polymorphism likewise here the DNA molecule is also present in more than one form having the same structure with a little bit change one so the DNA exists in five different forms particularly in the case of right-handed helical form 
DNA. So A, B, C, D, E as I mentioned earlier. So right-handed helical DNA. Here the helical structure occurs in the right-handed form, right-handed orientation. Now the B DNA. So that is the most available form of DNA, the most biologically active form of DNA, the commonly occurring DNA, the naturally occurring DNA in most of the living cells. So biologically active form, commonly available form, naturally occurring form of DNA in most of the living cells, the BDNA. In contrast to the BDNA, we have just actually another form of DNA, the one which has no hereditary stability. So if you are taking this BDNA, it is having more stability, hereditarily it is responsible for the transmission of character, it is more stable. But with reference to another DNA, what we call this one is a DNA, the zigzag DNA. With reference to the stability, in terms of hereditary value, it has no hereditary stability. Now this is a DNA, also called left-handed DNA. It was normally discovered by two groups of people from two different countries, one from India, another from New Zealand. So one group, what is called the Rolly group in New Zealand, Rolly group in New Zealand. And another group, what is called actually the Sussex segment group of India. So these groups of people normally isolated a specific form of DNA separately, independently. And that form of DNA is called is a DNA, also called left-handed DNA. It has no hereditary stability at all. Now, what are the main differences between these two? If you want to compare these two types of DNA, we can have certain differences. I mentioned earlier, the B DNA is a right-handed DNA and is a DNA is a left-handed DNA, the helical. Just the coiling occurs, the helix occurs in the left-handed orientation and that one occurs in the case of right-handed orientation. Then, in the case of B DNA, the number of base pairs per turn, that is in pitch, is about 10 we discussed already. But in the case of this is a DNA, the number of base pairs would be 12 in each tone or pitch. So what is the distance, what is the pitch of the helix? I mentioned earlier 3.4 nanometer at 34 angstrom, but here it is about 45 angstrom or 4.5 nanometer. And that too the number of base pairs actually 12. So if you divide actually 4.5 nanometer or 45 angstrom by 12, we will get the value, you know that one, the base pair distance, the equal distance is about 0 0.375. Unlike the, unlike the B DNA, where you have only just 0 0.34 nanometer, as we have only 10 bases, total distance of 34, and strong or 3.4 nanometer. Here we have, as we have 12 base pairs, the total length of 44 and strong or 4.5 nanometer, so the distance between two successive nucleotides will be 0 0.375 nanometer. Then, the diameter of the helix. So because of the pairing between purine and pyrimidine, I mentioned already, we have actually, through the entire length of the DNA, we have uniform dimension of uh, 30 angstrom in the case of B DNA. But the diameter of the Z DNA is less than that of the B DNA, where you have an 80 angstrom. It is much lesser in diameter. Then the angular rotation is about 36 degree. So what is the angular rotation? So it is just like a staircase, you know that one. And each step of ascent, at each step of ascent, normally the helix or the strand turns about 36 degree. The turning, the degree of actually turning is about 36 degree. It is also called as angular rotation. But in the case of this one, it is about 60. The angular rotation in the case of is that here is about 60 degree. So this is actually while it is forming a strand cast at, at each step of ascent, normally the strand turns 36 degree, which is also called as angular rotation, there it is 60. So these are some of the basic differences between that is B DNA and Z DNA. And also we have one more difference, you know that one is a biologically active form DNA and has more hereditary stability. It is not biologically active form DNA, not having more hereditary stability. This is also another difference with the reference to the functional aspect. Now, so these are some of the characteristics with the reference to what is called the Watson and Crick model of DNA as proposed by these two people in 1953. And also we have something is going on inside the cell. What is a secret that is going on inside the cell? 
and that secret what is going on inside the cell is called the central dogma. What is the central theme or the story what is happening inside the cell? You know that one we have the proteins inside the body. The proteins are responsible for doing almost all the functions. That is why they are considered as work horses of the cell. Work horses. The proteins are considered as the work horses of the cell. So they are the ones doing almost all the functions, carrying out the various activities. If the protein form is not proper, if it is normally just actually some sort of problem, non-functional protein is formed due to some changes in the genetic material that will affect the phenotype and the function will not be carried out. That is why normally the proteins are considered as the work horses of the cell as they perform the different functions of the body. The hormones, the enzymes, the metabolic, Catalytic functions all being performed by the protein only, they form the backbone of the cell. That is why they are called as work horses, doing almost more activities. Now, Francis Crick expressed the central dogma, I think, by the central theme of the cell, or uh, what is happening inside the cell, and what is the secret that is going on inside the cell. So, the main theme or the idea of what is happening inside the cell. The secret is nothing but you know that one. We have the genetic material in the form of DNA. The DNA contains the genetic information for the synthesis of various proteins. So the genetic information is flowing from the DNA to form the protein. But we need a messenger. We need a carrier to carry the information from the DNA towards the protein to synthesize protein. So, what is happening in the cell, we have to increase the number of cells, we have to increase the number of DNA, that process of what is called increasing the number of DNA molecule is called replication. So the cell is dividing, more and more cells are formed. When the cells are dividing, we know that one, the DNA also divides. So that phenomenon is called replication. Here I am representing just actually the circle, the DNA we have undergoing replication process forming more and more number of DNA molecules. So the DNA contains the genetic information. Now the genetic information is flowing from the DNA to protein. I mentioned earlier, the flow of information is only through a mediator. The mediator is not other than what is called the messenger RNA. He is the one who carries a message, the genetic information to the protein. Then only we can have the protein synthesis. So, this what I represented just here in the form of an illustration is nothing but central dogma. So in the case of central dogma, it indicates or expresses the flow of genetic information from DNA to protein through RNA. And that is being expressed by Francis Crick. And he called it as central dogma of the sun. Or also we can say the central dogma of molecular biology. When they are talking about the DNA, Studying about DNA, that study is called molecular biology. So in terms of molecular only we are expressing everything what is going on inside the cell. So the central dogma is nothing but the flow of genetic information from DNA to protein via mRNA. Now what is happening? So normally the DNA transfers the information to the mRNA by a process what is called transcription. So the message being copied in mRNA just like being printed on mRNA by a process what is called transcription. So the message is being normally copied in mRNA. That process of copying of mRNA on DNA template is called transcription. We will study it in the next topic. Now, once the message has been transferred to mRNA, the message is translated to form the protein. So the second event is translation. So, the first event in the gene expression is nothing but the transcription process. The second step in gene expression is nothing but translation process. And that is what is happening inside the cell. And that is called what is known as central target. So, transcription is the first step in gene expression. And translation is the second step in gene expression. And both are taking place inside the cell in a sequential manner. From DNA to mRNA to protein. And that story together call what is known as central dogma, what is happening inside the cell. It was proposed by Francis Crick, the person who also described the molecular model of DNA. But in the case of, so you have just normally the information is flowing from DNA to RNA. This is what is happening. 
This is the right direction. DAV to OR. This is what is happening, the flow of information, the right direction. In some cases, in a rare instance also, in some viruses, but peculiarly, specifically, the transcription occurs in the reverse direction. Instead of just transcribing the message by DNA, the message has been transcribed by RNA. It takes place in the reverse direction. Here the RNA is directing the synthesis of DNA. But there in the normal transcription, the DNA directs the synthesis of RNA. So the first event is called transcription process, where the DNA directs the synthesis of RNA. The second event here, the reverse process occurs. That is why it's called reverse transcription process. Reverse transcription. So the first event transcription is mediated by the enzyme, what is called DNA dependent RNA polymerase. Because the product RNA that is being actually polymerized by the enzyme RNA polymerase. That is why it's called DNA dependent RNA polymerase. The process called transcription. It is mediated by a polymerase enzyme. RNA polymerase enzyme, it is working under the control of DNA, that is why it is called DNA dependent RNA polymerase. But the reverse transcription process, here the RNA directs the synthesis of DNA, so the product form is called DNA, that is mediated by what is called DNA polymerase. The enzyme involved in reverse transcription is nothing but DNA polymerase, working under the influence of RNA, that is why it is called RNA dependent DNA polymerase. As it performs a function of reverse transcription, the RNA dependent DNA polymerase is also called reverse transcriptase enzyme. Reverse transcriptase. This is the nickname based on the function, but the original name nothing but the DNA polymerase working under the influence of RNA. That is why we can say RNA dependent DNA polymerase. That is nothing but the reverse transcriptase enzyme. That just actually proceeds in the reverse direction, unlike the normal direction. Of DNA to RNA. Here RNA to DNA. That is why the enzyme is called reverse transcriptase. Don't forget that one. It is nothing but RNA dependent DNA polymerase. So it is very common in the case of retroviruses like AIDS viruses. So I will show the picture now. So this is a normal cellular dog. That I represent a simple manner to get somewhat a diagrammatic manner. So here the replication process is going on. The first thing. DNA to DNA. DNA directs the synthesis of DNA. It is an autocatalysis process. Autocatalysis process because the DNA itself is capable of directing its synthesis. This is called autocatalysis. That is mediated by DNA polymerase. Now we are getting more and more DNA. Now the DNA contains genetic information that is being copied in mRNA with the help of RNA polymerase. And this is what is called transcription. DNA directs the synthesis of RNA. Then the message in the RNA being normally translated to form the product. The product is nothing but the protein. And the protein is formed in a structure what is called the ribosome. That is considered as a factory of the cell or protein factory of the cell where protein makes in the cells. So here the RNA being translated to form protein. Here the DNA is translated to form RNA. This is a normal central dogma. But I mentioned an eccentric case in the case of retroviruses. You see that one. So the right side represents the normal course. DNA replication, then transcription DNA to RNA, then we have the translation process. The message in the RNA being translated from the protein. But you see on the left side represents some other thing. So this is the one, the green, what I represent, the green colored arrow. Here you see that one, the reverse transcription process. Here the RNA directs the synthesis of DNA. The enzyme involved is nothing but reverse transcriptase. I mentioned already it is nothing but RNA dependent DNA polymerase. That's why it's called reverse transcription process. So, central dogma generally we have this one. And this is even normally happening in the case of retroviruses like AIDS virus. One of the capacities of AIDS virus is the phenomenon of transcript, reverse transcription as it possesses reverse transcriptase enzyme. That's why it's having more stability survival value, killing what is called the T lymphocytes, the help vessels, the one which is responsible for the creation of actually antibodies by the B lymphocytes. Now the next one, packaging of DNA. So the DNA is normally packaged inside the cell in a definite manner. 
And before that, I would like to give us just what is called a problem related to how can you calculate the length of a double helical DNA? That is a formula. How can you calculate the total length of the DNA? So, in way we can calculate in terms of picogram. So, one picogram is equal to 10 to the, 10 to the power of minus 12 grams. So, the DNA mass or weight can be calculated by means of picogram and measured by unit what is called picogram, 10 to the power of minus 12. Now, we have normally in the human deployed cell, we have 5.6 picograms. And if you are calculating the length of one picogram DNA after weighing it, take one picogram of DNA. So, it is a long filament structure, you know that one. Just to calculate its length, it is about 31 centimeter. So, anyway, in a human deployed cell, the total length of DNA is about 174 centimeter, and the total weight of 5.6 picograms. 1 picogram is equal to 31 centimeter in terms of our length, and weight 1 picogram is equal to 10 to the power of minus 12 grams. This is, these are all some of the things we have to know, bear it in mind. Now, the packaging of DNA, and in that one, we can also calculate it the length. So, how to calculate the length of DNA in a mammalian cell? You have to take the total number of bases. For example, in the case of human deployed cells, 6.6 into 10 power 9 into 10 power 9. That is a total number of base pairs. And it should be multiplied by a distance between the two consecutive base pairs. For example, in the case of human deployed cell, and if you are taking the DNA molecule in a mammalian cell or in the case of eukaryotes, the total distance in one turn is about just what we call 3.4 nanometer. There are 10 base pairs. So, the distance between two successive base pairs is about 0 0.10, sorry, I mean 0 0.34 nanometer. So, if you want to calculate the total length, you have to take the total number of base pairs multiplied by the distance between two successive base pairs. For example, the case of mammalian cell, as you know. So, this is the total number of base pairs in the case of mammalian cell or human cell 6.6 into 10 power 9. And the distance between the two successive base pairs is about 0 0.34. If you want to get the value in meter, it should be multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 9. If you want to get the value in centimeter, it should be multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 7. If you want to get the value in terms of what is called millimeter, it should be multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 6. So 10 to the power of minus 9 for getting value in meter, 10 to the power of minus 7 for getting because we have the problem like that when they are asking either in meter or in centimeter and millimeter. Accordingly, we have to just make this value change. For getting the value in meter in length, it should be multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 9. For centimeter, 10 to the power of minus 7. And for just actually calculating the value in terms of millimeter, it is about 10 to the power of minus 6 millimeter. So, here I want to calculate the length of the DNA in terms of what is called meter. So, the total number of base pairs 6.6 into 10 power 9, and the distance between the two successive base pairs 0.34. As I would like to calculate for meters, it should be multiplied by 10 to the power of minus. 9 meter, so we are getting the total length of the DNA is about 2.24 meter approximate. 2.2, sorry, 2.2 meters. And this is a calculation how to calculate the length in terms of. If you have any one of these values given, for example, the number of base pairs you can calculate. You want to calculate the number of base pairs, some values are given, we have the problem later also. So by getting one value, you can get another value by using the formula. But the length of the DNA in a deployed cell is much longer than that of what is called dimension of the nucleus because the dimension of the nucleus is approximately 10 to the power of minus 6. Such a small sized structure can hold a length of DNA much larger than that of the dimension of the nucleus. So we have 2.2 meters, such a long DNA molecule being kept coiled in a nucleus of size. 10 to the power of minus 6. Okay, so that is what we have. Then, I mentioned already, you can calculate the, just any other value if you know the value of uh, that is any one. For example, the length of equally DNA is about 1.36 millimeter. Now the length is given in millimeter. Remember that one. It is not in meter. It is not in centimeter. 
it is given in it may be given in meter or it may be given in centimeter accordingly how to change the calculations calculate the number of base pairs in equal now what is the solution so the formula you know that one the length of the dna is equal to number of base pairs multiplied by distance between base pairs here they are asking about what is called the number now as the length of dna here is 1.36 mm the number of base pairs we have to get the answer multiplied by the distance either in bacteria or human it's always constant between the two bases so you have 0.3 for nanometer but here just i'm just using instead of in the previous problem the mammalians are used for example with the power of minus 9 if the question is about the length in meter but if they are asking actually here it is given only in millimeter so you have to take the value to the power of minus 6 millimeter base pair. So therefore the number of base pairs is equal to see that one just 1.36 into 10 power 6 divided by 4. So actually so the number of base pairs therefore the number of base pairs is equal to 1.36 into 10 power 6 divided by 0 0.34 that is equal to 4 into 10 power 6. 4 into 10 power 6. So, so this is the, actually the line should come down here. So anyway, just we have, we'll make a correction later now. So 1.36 multiplied by 10 power 6 divided by 0 0.34 that is equal to 4 into 10 power 6. That is the, actually the number of base pairs. 4 into 10 power 6, the number of base pairs in the case of equal like if the length of dna is about 1.36 millimeter now we have to just understand how far packaging occurs in both eukaryotes and prokaryotes first let us take the packaging of dna in prokaryotes and though you have no definite nucleus in the case of bacterial cell or the prokaryotes the Nucleic acid or the DNA is not scattered throughout the cytoplasm, it is localized in the center. So in a normal eukaryotic cell, we have the nucleus in the geometrical center of the cell. But here we have no nuclear membrane, there is no well-defined nucleus in the case of bacterial cell. Though well-defined nucleus is absent, the DNA material is localized in the center, it is not scattered throughout the cell. How is it possible? You know that when the DNA is a negatively charged molecule, this negatively charged molecule being placed or held up in the center in a region, what is called nucleoid. The region is called nucleoid. In the region, we have a positively charged protein. That positively charged protein held the DNA molecule being localized in the center. So the region where the DNA is kept is called the nucleoid. Where you have a positively charged, positively charged protein, sorry, positively charged protein. So interaction between the negatively charged DNA molecule and positively charged protein just normally responsible for keeping the DNA in the nuclear position of the cell. So in the nuclear region, the DNA is not present as such. It is being organized, you know, that one long loops, like this, long loops. The loops are held together by means of what is called the positively charged protein. That is a packaging of DNA in prokaryotes. How far the DNA being packaged in the prokaryotes? So this, this is in this way. So, protein, a positively charged one, present in a localized area, what is called nuclei, where the DNA is kept. This is because of the positively charged protein. And it forms loops, and the loops are held together by means of positively charged proteins. Now, what is happening in the case of eukaryotes? How is normally the packaging of DNA occurs in eukaryotes? So we have in eukaryotes we have a set of positively charged proteins. These proteins are actually bound with the DNA to form a nuclear protein in no that one. And such positive charged proteins, normally basic proteins, because they have highly concentrated basic proteins, and these proteins are called histones. So there is a set of positively charged basic proteins. So histones are positively charged basic proteins. That's the answer you have to remember. Histones are nothing but positively charged basic proteins. And uh, 
How is it and how is the positive charge of histone maintained? What are the factors responsible? So normally the positive charge depends upon the number of amino acid residues and those amino acids with what is called charged side chains. If you have more number of amino acids with the charged side chains, then we have positive charge. And now the histones are mainly made up of two basic proteins. So two basic amino acids, not proteins. Just I missed it. Sorry for it. So anyway, we have two basic amino acids, which are basic amino acids, positively charged amino acids. They are nothing but arginine and lysine. So arginine and lysine are the two basic amino acids, positively charged amino acids. They have positive charge in their side chains. So we have number of amino acids. What is seen actually? Positively charged, neutral, aliphatic aromatic amino acids. So we have a number of actually amino acids based on the charges possessed by the side chains. So anyway, histones are rich in basic amino acids and they are all normally nothing but arginine and lysine and they possess positive charges in the side chains. Because of the cumulative effect of these two amino acids, normally the protein histone is positively charged. Now let's take the structure of histone protein because it is very much important for the formation of one structure what is called nucleus so and if you are taking the basic protein histone it is having a diameter of 110 angstrom and a height of 55 angstrom and which is being formed of 5 classes of proteins there are 5 classes of proteins they are designated as H1, H2A and H2B H3 and H4. These are the five classes. H1, H2A and B, H3 and H4. These are all the five classes of proteins. And these five classes of proteins are normally just arranged in two regions. One region contains eight molecules, another region contains only one. So normally one region containing eight molecules of what is called this histone proteins. That is why it's also called octamer. And they are nothing but H2A, H2A, H2B, H3, H4 into 2. So totally there are 2 H2A, 2 H2B, 2 H3 and 2 H4. So each one is being represented by 2 molecules. That's why I mentioned the word 8 molecules. So 4 into 2 will get the 8 molecules. They form the outer. The another region of the histone contains only one molecule, namely H1, H1. So that is why the five classes of histones or localites are arranged in two regions. One region contains eight molecules, another region contains only one molecule, namely H1. So if you're taking the histone code, so the main just part, it consists of normally eight histone molecules. That's why I mentioned that is actum. The histone is nothing but actum. So we have eight histone molecules. And these molecules are arranged in the form of two flat tetrons, four in the lower type and four in the upper type. Four in the lower type and four. So arranged in two types. That's why I mentioned here two flat tetrons. So two flat tetrons of I mentioned H2E, H2B, H3, H4. So each one being represented by two types. That's why we have two tetrons. One tetramer is formed of H2A, H2B, H3, H4. Another tetramer which is lying over it in the form of what is called as stack over H. Also formed of H2A, H2B, H3 and H4. And stack one on the top of another. Just if you have four molecules at the bottom and four molecules at the top, just they are stacked one above the other. And normally these histone proteins are the molecules have protein fibers or what we call this one the tails or also called as fingers just actually around the DNA molecule. They produce fingers or fibers around the DNA molecule, the one which is normally wrapping around these histones. And now normally the DNA, so we have two octomers are linked together. Normally if you are taking for example one octomer which is being wrapped by the DNA, we have another octomer which is also just actually wrapped by DNA and the two being linked by means of a DNA, that is what is called the linker DNA. I have shown you the picture. The two atomers which are wrapped around by the DNA, 
or connect with one another by a DNA. That DNA is called as a linker DNA as it connects the two atoms. You see the picture. Now normally the eight atoms are wrapped around. Wrap around so it is actually the eight atoms are wrapped around by the DNA. And the remaining one, H1, is normally attached to the linker H. We can see the picture. Now you see that one, this is what I want to show this natural though I represent here only six, but normally we have eight. We will we'll see it in the next picture. You see the height, 55 angstrom, then the diameter, 100 angstrom. You see that one, this is the linker DNA. It is connecting two octons. So this is one. This is this unit is called what is known as the DNA plus octomer histone together called as nucleosome. The two nucleosomes are interconnected by means of a DNA, what is called linker DNA, to which attached what is called the H1 protein. So the eight atoms we have wrapped around by this DNA, and one protein H1 is normally attached to the linker DNA or linker region, the linker DNA region or linker DNA. A uh, linear DNA is nothing but a connected between the two nucleosomes. I will show that one later. Just we have. So, what do you mean by a nucleosome? I mentioned already the DNA is a negatively charged molecule. It is normally wrapped around what is called a positively charged octum. Positive charged octum, the histone octum, to form a structure of what is called nucleosome. So, a nucleosome is nothing but a combination of histone october plus DNA. So histone october plus DNA to form what is called nucleosome. And if you are taking what is called a typical nucleosome, it contains a DNA wrap around. The number of nucleotides in the DNA would be 200 base pairs. What is the total number of base pairs in a DNA helix which normally wrapping around the nucleosome or which, which is normally wrapping around what is called octomer. The total number of what is called the base pairs in that DNA strand is about 200 base pairs. And normally, what do you mean by nucleosome I mentioned? So normally they are concentrating the repeating units of a chromatin. A chromatin, nothing but you know that one straight threads normally form inside the nucleus. So the nucleosomes normally repeat or they are the repeating units of a fiber, a thread-like structure. The darkly strain structure, when strain is given, it takes strain more, and that thread like structure is nothing but what's called chromatin. So, the nucleosomes are arranged on a chromosome, just like a base on a string like structure. Base on a string, just like a base on a string. The nucleosomes, normally in the chromosomes, they are observed as base on a string like structure. That was represented by a person by name Woodcock in 1973. So on a chromosome we have a number of beads. Ring actually there is just normally string together by means of a thread. The thread is nothing but the chromatin. We have the nucleosome. So the beads and a string structure was first represented by Woodcock in 1973. So they are formed in what is called the chromatin or you can say the chromosomes. So normally the chromosomes are nothing but the condensed part of chromatin fibers. The chromatin fibers are nothing but actually structure formed by the chromatin. Or on the chromatin, we have just the beads in a string, nothing but the nucleosomes. So, this is one structure. I'll show a definite one. This one gives an idea. So, this is one nucleosome. So, the nucleosome is formed, we see that one, two, four, six, and eight molecules H2A, H2B, there are four. Then, H3, two, H4, two. So each one is represented by 2, H2A2, H3, sorry, H2B2, H3, 2 and H4 also 2. So they are arranged one above the other just like a stack of points. One stack of tetrama is placed over another tetrama. So this is upper type and this is the lower type. And it is being wrapped around by this DNA. You see that one red color filament is nothing but the DNA. Now this is the DNA strand connecting two adjacent nucleosomes. That's why it's called linear DNA. To this only attached what is called the H1. This is H1. Though it is not represented here. Here the H1 is attached. Likewise, this is H1. So that is about the structure, a possible model of nucleosome. And this one, the possible model, the same one was represented by Korenberg. 
person died in 1974. That's the first person that presented the model of nuclear soap. Here is another picture how far the liquid is formation. So first you see that one in this case we have H K H to B. One, two, they combine together to form a diamond. Then they form a tetragon, it is not being represented. Likewise, here H4, H3 and H4 combine together to form a diamond, and both combine together to form a tetragon, and both tetragons join together to form the histone atomer. Now we see that what I mentioned about the nucleosome. Histone atomer plus DNA is equal to nucleus. So it is nothing but a structure formed of eight histone atoms wrapped around by the DNA mode. This is the molecular structure, what is the presented. This is another diagram, another illustration showing the nucleosomes. Here a number of nucleosomes, you can see that one the beads on a string. So one nucleosome is connected by means of the linear DNA to which is attached, you see that one H1. So now if you are taking this above, uh, surface view, we can see the H1 histone. So there are six nucleosomes. Each one has H1, and each H1 is connected to the linear DNA. This is how far we have number of nucleosomes arranged on a chromatin, just like a base on a string, giving the appearance of base on a string as proposed by Koch. So anyway, the nucleosome is nothing but the fundamental packaging unit of fundamental packaging unit of chromatin. Just remember that one. So, we have some more about this one. And I, I would like to continue as we have the time almost over and surpass the time. I'm concluding my part. I'll continue about the nucleosome once again. A few notes about that one in the next class. Till then, goodbye. Thank you. Now the class is complete.